everyone. I'll just do my introduction and that gives you, give people a, a chance to, to join and at least when they join they'll know, know that they can hear us. Um, I just wanted to welcome everybody to um, the Health Services Research Association of Australia and New Zealand's webinar. Um, the association aims to promote networking, um, education and training in Australia and New Zealand and to build capacity in health services research in the two countries. Um, uh, we've had a lot of registrations today and it's great to have so many people joining us from New Zealand. Um, we run these webinars uh, at least once a month. They're three and open to non-members, but we do give priority to um, HSR members and we do encourage participants to uh, go to our website and have a look at our membership options as we are um, do rely on uh, association fees for most of our income. Um, as well as our webinars, we run a number of act other activities throughout the year and our next big event is our symposium and AGM, which we're holding at the National Press Club in Canberra on the 1st of December. Um, and at that event, we'll be launching uh, preliminary results of a project that we're running with Newcastle University into the state and potential of health services research. Um, and at that event as well, we'll be awarding uh, a number of um, prizes for the, the best and most impactful health services research uh, over 2016. Um, and our big event is next year, our biennial um, Health Services Research and Policy Conference, which we're holding on the Gold Coast on the 1st to the 3rd of November. And the uh, theme this time is Shifting Priorities, Balancing Acute and Primary Care Services. So please keep an eye on our website for more information about the programme. Um, we also run a mentoring scheme for emerging uh, researchers and uh, a regular um, bulletin with news, events and um, job opportunities. Uh, today, um, all the delegates should be able to hear and see everything that's going on our, on our screens, but we can't see or hear you. But you can communicate with uh, us and with Judith uh, using the chat button. And any questions you've got, please put them in the Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen. And um, we will relay those to Judith at the end of her presentation, which I think will go on for about 40 minutes. Um, and hopefully we'll get a good conversation going at the end of her presentation. Um, I'm recording Judith's presentation and we'll put her, the recording and the slides up on the HSR website in a day or two. And if you were registered, you'll get an email telling you when those are available. Um, and I'll pass over to Suzanne Robinson from Curtin University. Suzanne is uh, one of the members of the Health Services Research Executive Committee and she's gonna chair the session today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah, and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be in the world today, or good morning if we have any UK or European visitors. Before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of our lands and pay respects to elders past and present. We've got a really exciting and interesting seminar again today, and really is a great pleasure to um, be chairing the session and welcoming our presenter, Professor Judith Smith from University of Birmingham. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, um, Judith will be presenting for around 40 minutes and then as Sarah's noted we'll have time for questions. So I'd strongly encourage you all to post questions as we go so you don't lose the thoughts and I'll collate those at the end and try to get through as many as we can, hopefully all of them. Okay then, by way of introduction, Judith is Director of the Health Services Management Centre and Professor of Health Policy and Management at the University of Birmingham. Prior to that, she was Director of um, Policy at Nuffield Trust. The Nuffield Trust is an independent charitable research foundation in London. Judith was based in New Zealand as a visiting senior research fellow at the Victoria University of Wellington and working in as advisor to the New Zealand Ministry of Health. As well as her academic work, Judith is non-executive um, director of the Birmingham Children's Hospital NHS Foundation Trust in the UK. She's honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a member of the board of the UK Health Services Research Network. Judith's had numerous roles working across policy and, and research around um, a number of different areas, including primary care. She's done lots of work around integrated care and evaluation of healthcare services. So I think Judith's really well placed to talk to us today around primary care and around the um, different ideas and models that are occurring across a number of different countries. 
So I'll hand over to Judith at this point and then I'll come back for questions at the end. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Suzanne and Sarah, for that welcome. So good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, and kia ora to uh, uh, colleagues in uh, New Zealand uh, as well. Um, what I'm going to uh, talk about today is about primary care. I'm really thinking about primary care that can be fit for purpose for what lies ahead of all of us and for the uh, pressing priorities I think many health systems are facing uh, across the world. I will probably focus more on Australia, New Zealand and the UK and what I've got to say but some reflections from the United States uh, and also drawing quite a bit on work I've been involved in at the, at the European level uh, with some work I've done in the last two or three years with the European Commission around uh, primary care. In terms of the agenda for the, uh, today's um, discussion, so I'm going to say something about the importance of primary care because I think it is, it is vital to keep thinking about why primary care is uh, and should be indeed central to our health systems and to ask some questions about how fit the purpose it is currently. Then using that as the basis to think about change that might be needed to our respective uh, primary care systems, all different aspects of those. Some thoughts about international experience and what we, we learn from, from one another. And uh, then to conclude with uh, some priorities for the, for the future. So starting first of all with the importance of primary care. And I make no apology at all for starting uh, back in 1978 with the uh, World Health Organization ALMA ARTA declaration, which I'm sure, as uh, many, if not all of you know, perhaps the, uh, the first sort of, I'd say, really significant international declaration about the importance and centrality of, of primary care. And I think that needs to remain our touchstone. Um, as we uh, consider change and redevelopment of our health systems. I think this fact that uh, our art is telling us about primary care as being a central function of the health system, particularly at its value in terms of overall social and economic development, I think is vital. And that's something I've always been struck by in my work, particularly in Australia and New Zealand with um, a Maori and Pacific Health Services in New Zealand or Aboriginal controlled services in Australia, I think they're the ones that in particular really uh, cleave to that, uh, that alma art spirit, albeit I know um, many other organisations uh, clearly seek to um, and also do that. But I think it's remembering that primary care is both that first level of contact that we, we have with the health system. Um, but also that point about it being part of a continuing health process. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about uh, continuity and coordination of care in what I have to say today, because I think that's become a particularly important function of primary care in recent times. And just to pay respect really as well to uh, the late Barbara Starfield and her work, because again, that's informed my thinking hugely over the past 20 years or so. Uh, and her thinking and indeed very vigorous research about the contribution of primary care to health systems and health. And I think just reflecting there, this paper I've uh, drawn out here that um, where Starfield's talking about primary care in terms of its importance in terms of improving population health and also helping to address uh, inequalities in health. Interestingly, Starfield's work that uh, often emphasised primary care as a route to contain costs in a health system. I just want to flag now, and we may return to it in discussion, that's coming under challenge more, um, more recently by work by a number of researchers, including groups in the Netherlands, but others. And there's a range of reasons for that. But the gatekeeping role of primary care, certainly in uh, Australia, New Zealand and the UK, again coming under challenge paper in the British Medical Journal in just the last few weeks, raising questions about is gatekeeping going to be fit for purposes as we move forward, particularly certainly in the UK context where we know that we have some quite poor outcomes for cancer because of late diagnosis that people are starting to ask questions about is, is there something going on there about primary care gatekeeping. 
So I honour the work of Barbara Starfield here, but I also suggest that uh, we need to be revisiting it and questioning it to clear around the issue, potentially, of gatekeeping. So I, I just like that one because that's a debate that, that's taking place internationally at the moment. So what does primary care need to address? Um, a couple of years ago, I was part of a European Commission special group that specifically was really rethink, trying to rethink the Alma Arta Declaration on Primary Care really for the European context, and particularly in relation to the financial austerity that uh, many, if not all, European countries have felt since the uh, global recession. And what we, we came up with, I mean, it's all available on the, um, uh, the Commission website, the sort of a revised declaration in a sense we, we, we concluded, was these five main aspects. You can see here about primary care needing to address population health, particularly amongst those at greatest risk. So getting that proactive uh, uh, set of sense in there. Also, um, primary care is managing short term, episodes of minor illness or injury, very particularly thinking about the importance of primary care in managing and coordinating the health and care of those who've got one or more chronic conditions, long-term conditions, and about managing um, urgent uh, illness, and finally, managing end-of-life care. I think the two aspects we felt <clears throat> we were adding in perhaps more here to work that's been done before was very much the role of primary care in care coordination and integration or increasingly complex range of services for people, but also the role in managing end of life care and seeking to do that where possible in community and home settings. And that picture there, just to sort of just give that feel of primary care uh, across the age ranges. And I just also wanted to add there that we can often think about some of the pressing needs for our populations about ageing. But I sit here this morning in the youngest city in Europe, Birmingham, um, where for us the needs of vulnerable families, uh, children living in poverty, children with obesity, and so forth, are probably some of our biggest health challenges in the city. So I guess just to hold in our minds this morning that uh, we are thinking about care for people right across the, uh, the age spectrum. So I'm also to talk there about the purpose of primary care, it's, it's vital importance. But in some work um, that I did three years ago uh, for a, a, a European summit on primary care that was organised by uh, the Lafield Trust and by KPMG, we, uh, from work across a whole number of examples of, of uh, primary care provision uh, within Europe, um, we concluded that um, primary care has some, some vulnerabilities, some, some challenges, and um, I'll set those out here, particularly that it's often delivered by small independent practices often have quite limited access to the wider multidisciplinary team, despite uh, what we might assert is, is what we'd like, like to be in place. It's often based on a model of uh, quite inflexible and short appointment slots, typically available Monday to Friday, and I say that's across many countries that's the case. And also still often struggling to offer phone or email, or Skype or other modern access to medical and nursing advice and I think um, not being able um, to directly uh, phone one's doctor, um, I mean, phone doesn't feel terribly modern access to, uh, uh, to care but uh, that is often the reality for, for a lot of people but that's still difficult to do. And again primary care sometimes has inadequate access to rapid uh, diagnostic services, and again, sometimes insufficiently connected to specialists, to community-based services such as pharmacy and perhaps other resources that would help it to function more effectively. Um, I've actually got this screenshot here from my own practice, which will remain nameless, um, somewhere in the West Midlands in the UK. Um, but I've actually just cho uh, chosen this, just to demonstrate, if you look carefully, on a Wednesday afternoon, the practice is closed, this is a practice that's clinically very, very good. Um, it's, a, it's a university teaching practice. It's got quite modern premises. 
um, not in any sense uh, problematic, apart from um, I have some questions about access, as you can see there, and also you might notice there's a note saying that the phone lines are closed at lunchtime and they're closed on public holidays and at weekends. So, primary care, yes, vital, but does this feel quite what we need in a, a modern, um, fast paced uh, society? I think that uh, shows that we've got some uh, challenges to address. And um, some of you will have heard me talk about this before, but I think this is really important work that Richard Saltman and colleagues undertook um, some 10 years or so ago now. Um, for primary care and the driver's seat. It was what they did for the European Health Observatory. They talked about the primary care paradox. Um, meaning there very much that we have this paradox where we, um, uh, uh, primary care, we, we find it to be relatively weak organisationally um, and sometimes it can seem that it's relatively unattractive within the health system and yet we constantly assert in policy that we need to assign more functions to it and as I've done this morning, just say how important it is so uh, for me, that paradox and that vulnerability of primary care are still very much, uh, very much uh, present. So we've talked about the, the importance of primary care, which ends there with that sense of paradox about it. Let's move on now to think about um, its fitness for purpose. So some of the, um, the challenges ahead, um, I mean, it seems to me that um, primary care is clearly having to balance financial constraints with rising demand, and one hears that from, from, from so many different countries. And I think that demand has two core aspects to it. On the one hand, it's people uh, presenting, supporting episodic care, uh, you know, the immediate problems of sorting out, but also more and more people who are living with um, one or more um, chronic conditions, um, so in ever more complex uh, situations. Um, we know as well that our policymakers uh, keep uh, asserting the desire to shift services to primary care, something that um, has been around for well over 20 years. And I think we shouldn't um, uh, be despondent about that because when we stop and think about it, um, in, in each of our countries, a lot more services are now available in primary care. And things have changed quite a lot um, without, without going into too many of those specific examples but I think a lot of progress has quietly and slowly but surely uh, been made. I think public and political expectations um, rise particularly about access and continuity. Um, would I have grumbled about my uh, practice not being open at, at weekends or in the evenings 20 years ago? Probably not because it doesn't kind of feel right now. Um, and another factor that I think has become far more significant as we've um, all got better at uh, collecting data and measuring um, quality of care is that we're much more aware now of the variation and indeed unwarranted variation between providers, uh, particularly in relation to some areas of evidence based practice. So it could be about prescribing, but it could be about uh, referrals, but it could be actually about uh, um, clinical care that's given. And I know that uh, so, some of the work, uh, particularly in New Zealand, but I think also now being used in um, Australia around uh, care pathways, so the work, so we can care about work, um, so those um, being taken forward, particularly in Canterbury in New Zealand. I think a lot of that's been um, about uh, really ensuring a strong evidence base to effective integrated care, it's based in, in, um, in primary care. I think uh, we will see more of that uh, type of work um, going forward. And the final point there is about technology. Um, I've hinted at the one about uh, uh, whether we can um, access primary care easily through whether it's email, Skype, through our uh, phone apps or, or whatever. Um, but again, a lot of interest in self-management and more direct care provision. I think we have to be very aware 
that there's a private sector um, again across um, across our countries uh, for this, and with other providers moving in. And a screenshot here of one uh, doctor care anywhere just happens to be one example here in the UK, but where you can pay a subscription um, and then have access to video and phone GP appointments when you want them, 24/7, 365 days a year. Um, it's just to make the point that there, is, there are others there now that may well remain marginal, but there is a question about will that start to cream off some of the uh, healthier and wealthier people in, um, in our respective societies. But I think we need to be aware of the fact there are challenges to the ways that sometimes that uh, core or, or traditional primary care has been provided. Thinking about primary care providers, um, a number of um, pressures typically face them again across our countries and, um, and we could add to that this country, such as the Netherlands and Canada and so forth. I think practices, because they're, quite, they're small organisations typically, they're often vulnerable to um, marginal reductions in income, particularly in times of financial austerity. And one hears time and again um, in research that they, they struggle to find the time, or we'll often talk about the headspace, to think and plan for new models of care and organisation. Just to, to take time out, whether it's to have an organisational development session, to do some detailed analysis of uh, care pathways, to think about what it would mean to have um, perhaps phone or email access. These, these things are not straightforward because there's the cultural and organisational parts of change that, uh, that need to be addressed. And practices often lack the staff to actually accommodate new clinical or administrative or indeed regulatory requirements. And certainly here in the, in the UK where general practice is now subject to regulation by our National Regulator for Care Quality Commission, it has some similarities to the way that hospitals and mental health providers are regulated. That's been a significant burden on general practice just to prepare for, for, for those processes and inspections. Now, that there's often potential for primary care to increase the scope of its work or its business, but again, sometimes there's a, a feeling that scale is needed for that. And I know that. Um, Again, in looking at uh, New Zealand, going back some 30 years or so, the Independent Practitioner Association movement in many ways always started to enable that, to enable practices to come together to bid jointly to uh, provide uh, different services or take on budgets together. And again, that's, that's often the theme across primary care of uh, joining together to um, be able to achieve something greater in terms of service provision or um, or clout, really, in, in the health system. And the final point there about the need for organisational development, management and other professional support. My original profession is as, as a health manager, um, and uh, I, I so much wish that uh, the uh, management jobs in primary care will just continue to become ever more attractive to health managers rather than seeing bigger and bigger hospital management jobs as the ones of with the, um, the kind of highest profile or recognition. Um, I think that is changing and we, have, and we need really sophisticated and high quality management in primary care, but actually securing that, securing the resource for that um, is another question. The Commonwealth Fund in uh, New York, as I'm, I'm sure, sure you all know, um, undertake um, a great range of uh, international health policy analysis and um, they periodically uh, do surveys of primary care physicians in a number of uh, countries and uh, the most recent one of those took place last year in 2015 and I thought this is interesting, um, the slide here to look at in that uh, it's um, looking at the views of the primary care doctors they talk to about coordinating care within countries. And if you look here, this is asking them about um, the primary care doctors when they hear about when a patient's been seen in the emergency department or has been discharged from hospital. 
Um, now, New Zealand, there you'll see, um, and the UK, where it's about sort of broadly around half the GPs here if a patient's been to ED, the numbers are lower if they've been discharged from hospital. But Australia Australians look, uh, based on this particular survey, look great in terms of it being just 80% uh, of them reporting that that happens. But I think my main point here is to say that we're saying primary care this morning is hugely important, that it's uh, critical to health development, to having effective health systems. But when we look at this, we're still not getting it right in at least half of the um, uh, instances, just in terms of that really, I would argue, rather basic coordination and communication between the hospital sector and primary care. And these were issues that when I started out as a, a young management trainee in the NHS uh, almost 30 years ago were a concern, and we've still got quite a long way to go. And I think this sort of analysis is quite salutary for us uh, in um, thinking about not only what the role what happens within primary care, but how effectively primary care is able to work with the wider system, and particularly when we think about integrated care in the hospital uh, sector. Um, in um, 2012 to 13, I was involved in uh, work when I, when I was at the Luffield Trust. Uh, work we did um, also with the King's Fund. It was actually commissioned by um, a region of the NHS, by Midlands and East Region. And they, uh, quite presciently, I would say, wanted us to look uh, internationally. Um, at different models of primary care that were emerging, and to sort of then come up with some criteria to by which you might assess those different models and the sense they're fit for purpose, and to well, rather ambitiously asked us to uh, propose some new thinking for the organisation of primary care. Now, that report in both summary and fuller form are on the Field Trust and Kingsman websites, and do include, I think, what a, what a useful. Um, uh, table of uh, all the different uh, models of uh, primary care that uh, that we um, discovered, and uh, um, and from that work, uh, I'm going to return to some of it a little later in the presentation. But our, our sort of main conclusions about this issue of fit for, fitness for purpose, what I set out here. We were pretty clear that the status quo is unlikely to be an option, and we're thinking, we were thinking then of the status quo as relatively those small independent practices operating um, what often on their own in quite isolated form. Um, we saw those of coming, coming under strain and, and feeling that infrastructure and development support were going to be vital. Um, we, we could see that uh, primary care in its very innovative uh, way that it tends to have internationally, getting on and developing um, different organisational models. Now, some of those were about what we call scale, so they were about um, forming organisations that look to some extent like IPAs would have done in New Zealand or um, uh, primary health networks as we probably think about them now both in New Zealand and obviously in Australia. Um, others were um, more about using different forms of technology uh, to help people access care. And others were more about integration with other providers, so organisations, um, more community health type organisations, which again we have in, in each of our countries, and others um, actually starting to emerge that were perhaps based around, for example, a community hospital, and then a set of primary care providers uh, connected in with that. Now in this work, um, one of our main, if not the main, conclusion was it was vital that the model of care was redesigned as well, if you're thinking about the future of primary care, that structural change is not enough. And if there's nothing else I leave with you uh, today, I think this would be my message. I've got a second big message I'll come to in a bit, but um, so many of us, researchers, policy analysts, managers, we can get very excited about new organisational um, models, uh, you know, whether something's a IPA or a super partnership or a primary health network, are they different to Medicare, from Medicare locals and so forth? But 
it's actually probably more complex and more challenging for us to both try and understand what's actually happening differently within the service. So what's different if I go along to that practice? Or how are they thinking about my care? How are they using the data? What are they doing that's going to enable my health to be different in the future? Or how can I access that practice differently? All of that, I would argue, is much more difficult to do. And we'll come back to this towards the end of the presentation. It's actually more difficult to research. So structural change is not enough. The model of care is critical. So taking that as, as the starting point for the, the next section, think about the change that is needed. Having to change primary care so that it is fit for purpose and can um, undertake the vital functions that we started with. In the work that uh, Nigel Edwards, Rebecca Rosen and I um, did uh, related to the European Primary Care Summit I mentioned in, in 2013, we came up with um, some, what we call some design principles. This is work we then took further forward with colleagues at the King's London and Nuffield Trust in that other report on, on primary care I just mentioned. So these design principles appear in both uh, uh, pieces of work that are developed further in one than the other. The main point being though from these was we, we were asserting when thinking about primary care and how it's organised, where possible, it's helpful perhaps to just go back to Perhaps it is his first principles in some senses and say, how would we design this if we were starting now rather than just tweaking what we've already got? And just some examples of those principles we were suggesting, you can see here that saying that patients should be able to see a senior clinician make a good decision about their management as early as possible in the process. Also, that their access to primary care, advice and support should be underpinned by the latest technology, which again should have the minimum number of consultations necessary. So you can see there, those were some clinical uh, principles. There were um, a couple more um, clinical ones as well. We also had some organisational uh, principles that we were suggesting would um, be helpful for primary care. And you can see here that an example being that primary care practitioners should have immediate access to a common set of diagnostics guided by clinical eligibility criteria, we should wherever possible have a single electronic patient record that other organisations can access but also that the patient can access to in their carer. Um, also that primary care organisations should be making information about the quality and outcomes of care publicly available in real time wherever possible. And also, back to my point about management, that primary care should have professional and expert management leadership and organisational support. The spirit of these design principles was to try and lift ourselves beyond anybody's individual health system to say these feel like some principles that are, uh, are important that can perhaps help in different contexts practitioners, managers, policy makers to say actually what is it we need or where do we need to focus our attention? Is it on making sure that um, we are using technology effectively in our primary care locally? Is it about a single patient um, electronic patient record? Or is it about differentiating the care we provide for people with complex long-term conditions from that we offer for those just presenting with episodic illness? That work on the design principles, that's a, um, the, a piece of work where we use that to the primary care paradox, borrowed that from Richard Salt and others, you can see it's some work that, that we published it through the Love the Trust and indeed at, at the time through KPMG. So the issues that I think need to be addressed when we think about change in primary care, just trying to um, draw these uh, together here, it seems that um, primary care is very much now needing some sort of collective arrangement or organisation for itself as providers. I'm not talking about as commissioners here um, this morning, but particularly as, as providers. 
And what I mean here, that might be some sort of network or federation, it, it might be um, quite a, a formal organisation where practices are actually um, members or even owned by that, but it might be also something that uh, they're affiliated with. But needing some sort of um, scale. Also, having a population health or capitated approach. Now, I don't mean here just the funding arrangements. Um, I mean, here in the UK, we've had a, a capitated uh, basis to our primary care funding right throughout the history of the NHS, but I would argue that uh, is not used sufficiently. I mean, the registered list, having that population health approach. I'm meaning here is where a practice can use the data, the information that it has from its list of uh, patients, from its members effectively, to be proactive. So to regularly get in touch with people who are at particular risk of a certain illness who are or in a certain risk category because perhaps of their age or because of their ethnicity, that they're going to actually reach out to them um, to offer them, whether that's screening, uh, perhaps more regular care, um, it may be to offer them specific interventions to help them lose weight, uh, to change their diet, all sorts of things like that. I think um, primary care increasingly needs to be able to do that. The point I've made already about attending to the actual model of care and not just organisational issues, I'm going to keep mentioning that one because it feels just so uh, important. Having an electronic personal health record that's accessible to staff and the patients, I think, is, is just, uh, just vital now. And worth noting that in a number of countries, um, uh, the practices becoming electronically enabled has actually been uh, made much better progress often than the hospital sector. So again, this is not a council of despair today. Uh, primary care is incredibly innovative and often uh, is ahead of the, the healthcare curve on some of these issues. In what we're talking about today, in primary care becoming, in a sense, more fit for the future, um, support for how to redesign workforce roles, I think, is becoming increasingly critical. And here, I, I mean, as well working sometimes with trade unions and professional associations, because time and again, particularly my work around integrated care, we spend a huge amount of time um, designing new approaches to care, analysing what's wrong at the moment, uh, talking about needing new multidisciplinary teams. And so often I find that it's very late in the day that the actual frontline staff who are going to actually have to work quite differently, whether that's a community nurse, whether it's a home care assistant or a allied health professionals, such as a physio or a occupational therapist, they're not involved. And then so many um, integrated care efforts in particular stumble at the point of implementation. Um, and it's often around those really practical, knotty uh, management issues, um, and I say often associated with uh, changing people's roles and how they work. Also, that's probably a related issue about finding ways to embrace technology in primary care, as I mentioned earlier, thinking about the wider organisational and development issues around that. And my second big point, I said there were two main um, points I was going to highlight particularly today. The one about what we're going to do about the model of care in primary care, how we're going to keep revisiting that in a way that means those design principles can be fulfilled. But the second main point today is to say, how can we, and this is um, not only practitioners but researchers, how can we really focus on the practice of implementation and other implementation research um, so that uh, new initiatives, new models of care, new approaches to integrated care, that they're really supported in the medium to long term that we have ways of reviewing them, researching them in some different ways, and being able to offer ongoing support. That's just a graphic, really. Um, you can see we spend, it's my point again, we spend a lot of time on the sort of right hand side there, thinking about where are we now, where do we want to be, planning it all out. But we so often don't get around to spend enough time on the making it happen. And I was having exactly the same critique. Uh, 
So the commissioning cycle is often used. We spend lots of time on design, on planning, uh, designing uh, new forms of care or even contracts, much less on implementation and review of that. And uh, going back around the circle. Moving on now to the fourth of the uh, five uh, elements of uh, today's uh, presentation. So thinking just from international experience from what's happening in our respective countries. Here in the UK, um, I hinted earlier, there's been quite an interest in what people talk about now as general practice at scale. The two main forms that that's been tending to take. There are a number now of what calls, people call super partnerships, where general practices, as the name suggests, have become larger, where they've gone through formal mergers. Um, uh, and uh, these initiatives are typically led by GPs. They're often for reasons of um, economic sustainability of practices, but also typically wanting to provide a wider range of services to address the unwarranted variation I mentioned earlier, and I guess to then form some larger, more robust organisations that can actually then um, be um, delivering what we think of, I guess, as more integrated care and even taking on contracts for services that we might have thought of as support based previously. Um, a couple of um, significant examples of these, there's one here in Birmingham called the Modality Super Partnership, and another one in Northamptonshire in the East Midlands called Lakeside. And in both cases, their population that's covered is um, in, the, in the tens of thousands um, now, well up, I think, towards 60,000 to 70,000. Also, a lot of interest um, in a, a lot of examples of general practice in networks and federations. These tend to be more collaborations of local practices who remain independent but come together. Um, sometimes as a, an additional legal entity that can hold contracts and again it's often about increasing scope of vision, increasing efficient efficiencies, it might be about organising after hours of care, um, but it's typically wanting to focus on still having that core uh, small business uh, model. See some pictures there of the uh, modality uh, partnership in uh, Birmingham, that's some of its uh, practices. You can see there, they're quite different uh, in the, their actual physical appearance and so on, but all part of the same organisation, the same back office support, but also clinical uh, services support and run as a, as a single organisation. Something else that's been taking place more in the last couple of years, really, is interest in um, I'm calling it vertical integration. What's effectively meaning there? We are seeing some hospitals uh, in England now starting to take over and run general practices. There's an example here in the, the Midlands in Wolverhampton. There's also another one in the northeast of England in Northumberland, um, which is a, a largely a rural area where the hospital is running a number of general practices, but also running social care, what we refer to often as disability services in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and uh, it's very much starting to describe itself as an accountable care organisation, uh, an ACO, is that model that, that we know from the States. Um, so that just some, uh, I, didn't, I should have mentioned there as well, that mental health is often part of those sort of uh, arrangements as well. So, so just to recap, there's sometimes that's about the hospital taking over general practices that perhaps are struggling, seeing that as a way of um, helping to uh, try and address demand for, um, for hospital services. Um, but it's also sometimes a more significant uh, integration that's seen for a whole health community trying to run all the health services in an integrated uh, manner. The second one there about horizontal integration, a number of examples emerging here now of what slightly clumsily are being called multi-specialty community providers, MCPs. If you hear us talking about those here, it's more likely in the health system to be talking about multi-specialty community providers than they're showing these things. Um, but uh, uh, what, what that's about is it's the at scale primary care again, um, but you're seeing that often joining with wider community health services, sometimes also again mental health and disability care as well. 
uh, and looking to hold a new integrated care contract. So whilst we've got those developments of the super partnerships and the federations really emerging from general practice, some of these other examples where it's perhaps hospitals reaching out, um, or indeed community and general practice working together uh, to try and form some sort of new organisation. So I guess in Australia and New Zealand terms, what you're seeing here, sometimes this is part of the New Zealand terms of district health board working with the at-scale primary care to form some new organisation, or in Australian terms, some of the state-based uh, sort of, uh, health services coming together. I think the message is that it's, um, there isn't one size fits all, and there are quite a lot of um, interesting things happening. But just hold that thought in your mind, is the model of care changing within it? That would also be one of my questions, we also get so excited about the organisations. A couple of pictures there from Northumberland, you can see they've got a new emergency care hospital, but you can also see one of their uh, community facilities there, just to give that feel that again they're part of the same organisation. Moving now to uh, New Zealand, which as mentioned earlier, I spent two years living and working in New Zealand, focusing on uh, research as primary care, uh, and say, as far as I can, uh, connected to, to what's happening. I've always been impressed and continue to be with New Zealand um, in primary care about the, the roots that the uh, independent practitioner associations, but also the community based and owned. Um, Providers, particularly for those that were for those years being affiliated with healthcare as um, that the being those in sense, those twin tracks of, of, of primary care development in New Zealand, but for me, it's sustaining a primary care of support and development organisations who exist to actually support the infrastructure, the provision of primary care has, has been remarkable and I think it's very special in New Zealand. Um, and then I'll say that I'm, I therefore look to the prevalence of the primary care networks, the uh, health, local health trusts, um, and uh, the different uh, health um, organisations. And um, I think that what I have um, detected more recently, that again I find really encouraging, is the work to change the actual model of care. Um, so I look there at uh, examples such as the work that I know that's going on in the Midlands Health Network around um, the uh, healthcare home approach. But again, I've mentioned earlier the care pathways from Canterbury. And I know there are other examples, they're just two that I've uh, picked out. So I think to both go beyond just that infrastructure support, which was an entry for premises, prescribing, specialist nursing, all those things that have happened, but to be really then in a sense, um, and under the bonnet of primary care and really sort of uh, um, looking at uh, what actually happens in terms of the model of care and thinking what that means for the workforce, for the referral patterns, the relationships, the wider health system. That to me is particularly interesting work that I say we watch with um, a lot of interest, certainly from here in the UK. Just a slight question or challenge, I'm interested to hear what colleagues have to say in, in, a, in a wee while, but is that actually often more like that horizontal uh, integration? I'm quite so aware of so much of that being always into the hospital, <coughs> mental health, uh, and other sectors. Just there to flag a pinnacle Canterbury. And then in Australia, um, I will hear from divisions to primary health networks. Um, I followed for, for many years the, the development and progress of the divisions of general practice, which clearly in Australia they were, were general practice owned, although federally funded networks, and they persisted for some 20 or so years. Um, I mean, looking back on it, I think there's a, a challenge that can be made. Like, I think I've made it before that. Uh, Commonwealth government perhaps could have uh, required and asked for more for the money that it invested in the divisions. So I'm not sure it, um, when they, the decision was taken to move on from divisions. I think they had achieved a lot. Uh, I know it was variable across them, but a lot of interesting primary care development and integrated care work. Um, I think there was some sadness for me that GP and organisations uh, uh, were, were disbanded. Um, because losing that professional ownership of primary care organisations is something I think you undertake at your peril. 
Um, but I'm very interested now to, to watch and to understand how that uh, is being that work is, is carried forward in the new primary health networks. I just flag here as well the Aboriginal controlled health services, really interesting models of care. Uh, yes, a different model of ownership, but I think uh, continues to be to be important and interesting and something that uh, a lot of us can learn from in terms of interesting, diverse and thoughtful models of, of care provision. The divisions of general practice were clearly replaced by better care locals with a more population health focus, more public health feel to them, and they didn't last for very long. And I know now we have the uh, in Australia the primary health networks. And as I understand that, very much a strong emphasis on care coordination, um, enabling primary care to be more effective and uh, efficient. And again, work going on is uh, certainly a number I know around uh, uh, care pathways. Now, the ambitions for primary health networks are significant, but I would, my sense is they're still in their early days in terms of implementation. And I think it's a really important point we look back to, particularly days of the experience from New Zealand. Um, it's going to be 20 or 30 years sometimes, so uh, that we, we build the primary care infrastructure and engagement and can actually uh, see through some of the changes uh, that are needed. And I know also that um, the new pilots coming in of the healthcare home approach in Australia, so we'll watch those with huge interest uh, because of the points I've made about uh, the concern for the model of care. I was sort of looking at on the internet for uh, logos uh, from the primary health networks. I just log here, it's interesting, there's clearly something like national, was it corporate about the uh, the, the logos, the similarities. I, I, I just flag a, a caution of what it's worth uh, that in primary care, when you have something that's sort of outdated by the state or, 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 or the nation, just how far do you then have that real local primary care ownership? And, and that's a challenge in each of our countries. It's a challenge in New Zealand as the primary health care strategy, and it's certainly a challenge in, in the UK where the government has a habit of spotting something that it thinks is good in. Uh, Certainly in the UK context, uh, there's a bit of a history of tending to sort of take it, take it over. Just thinking about the United States for a moment, uh, just, just briefly, the, the primary care medical home, um, a model that started originally um, in paediatrics, extended to general primary care. There are some interesting examples we can draw on. Group Health in Seattle, with Bob Reed and others there, the uh, Yuka in, in, in Alaska and others. The idea being that there's lots now being written about this, that patients belong to a primary health care team partnership, a population health based approach. They try and be proactive and preventative, as we talked about earlier, to plan and coordinate people's care. And some of them, indeed, uh, the example in Alaska being one, you're building on a community owned uh, model of primary care. A lot's talked about the primary care medical home, and I, don't, and I know that is influenced work that's now going on in New Zealand and Australia, but I sometimes question myself, is this in fact properly effective primary health care? It's actually what Starfield and Alma and Alma Arta re really wanted, but uh, so we need that check, perhaps we have to keep going back to that. But actually, those countries, like Australia, New Zealand and the UK, where we have the system of general practice, that's national, where people um, are registered with a practice uh, or, or, or I know, uh, with a PHO, um, we're actually in a really good position, I think, to, uh, to take forward a primary care medical home approach. In work that's starting to emerge on um, healthcare medical homes or the primary care medical home from the states, um, we see some reports of improvements in quality of care, some tentative results about. Uh, reducing emergency ambitions and, and some improvements uh, for the working lives of doctors and other professionals, which indeed are what one starts to tentatively hear from other at scale models, such as the super partnerships in the UK. I say tentatively because the research base, as I'm going to just conclude with in a moment, is still somewhat lacking in all these areas. Another a more recent paper here from Patient centered medical home work um, in the United States. 
This one particularly talks about the importance of electronic records, about financial incentives and support for development. So it's back to some of those infrastructure and management issues as being critical if you're going to have a, a fully functioning primary care uh, medical home approach. I'm going to conclude now with just some thoughts about priorities uh, for the future. I think all these um, different new models of primary care, whether they're around healthcare homes, or networks, or super partnerships, or whatever they may be, the intensive benefits typically read like this. What's more population health approach, standardised, improved care, you can see their care coordination, a better deal for experienced staff, um, greater influence, um, and, and more efficiencies. And indeed, renewed energy and motivation for the partners and others in the team. That's one, one he's had a lot in research that uh, um, different hospitals are involved in with these models of primary care. Uh, in just the last few weeks, colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the Nuffield Trust have produced a, a very good, very thorough review of the literature on at scale primary care. It's on the Nuffield Trust's website. And you can see here, it talks about the ambitions of uh, these uh, different approaches to primary care, which I've just mentioned. But a really important point is their conclusion from their review, there's little good quality evidence to confirm or refute these ambitions around workforce, quality of care, efficiency and so on. They conclude there are some promising results for managed general practice networks where there's targeted investment and management support. So, so that's, uh, that's encouraging um, and saying, or just noting that um, primary care networks and organisations can help with the process of regulatory issues. But pointing out that we really do lack good research on impact on patients and on costs. They conclude that the engagement of GP seems critical, something that I have uh, certainly in my own work been very clear about over many years. But importantly as well, pointing out that local and national contracting, you know, that the gritty business of contracting finance is also significant. And I just remind us here as well about the lessons from integrated care, which I think are, are rather similar. That you know the evidence base on coordinated and integrated care that I think so many of us believe integrated care to be important. The evidence base remains equivocal as to development because again we know that care quality and patient experience are typically improved where we, we address the care coordination. But there's uncertainty about the relative effectiveness of approaches and particularly about cost. So I think it's at our peril at the moment that we try to assert too strongly that shifts into primary care or integrated care efforts are actually going to reduce cost in the system. They will likely improve uh, patient experience, potentially staff experience as well, but we have to be cautious about cost at the moment, and we certainly don't have enough uh, uh, good research. Also, how far our initiatives really harnessing IT and data and taking a properly person-centered approach. For, for those of us, and I think probably many on the, the, the webinar today are researchers, it's a real challenge to us to really think differently, I think, about our methods, use mixed methods more. We need to be looking at cost and activity data, uh, patient experience data alongside our uh, qualitative study of organisations and staff uh, experience. A great paper by colleagues from the uh, UK Health Services Research Network and National Institute of Health Research this is in the British Medical Journal a few months ago by Tara Lamont and, and colleagues, but really setting out um, some thoughts about the ways in which, as health services researchers, we can perhaps work in some different, uh, more sophisticated ways to help answer these knotty problems, particularly such as those we're talking about today. My conclu very concluding thoughts, there is something really significant happening in primary care. Um, I think the organisations are becoming more sophisticated, they're taking on a wider scope of services, but they're also more organisationally sophisticated, and that's driven by changing patterns of demand, mobility, and the complexity that people face in particular, partly about older people, but also, as I mentioned earlier, about younger people, people living with mental health problems, and so forth. 
I think those four models of primary care organisation now being questioned and renewed, uh, often from the bottom up. But just remember at that point I made earlier that even gatekeeping is starting to be, to be questioned. But in all of this, there's something important about scaling up, but there's something equally important to me about care coordination and integration, a really judicious use of technology. And in one sense, to start with the point I, I made very early in the presentation, there is just a real risk of structures of organisational form getting ahead of function, and it's the actual change to the model of care, thinking about perhaps those design principles, I think that's critical. My very final point, implementation is critical. And I would say this is a regional health service manager all the time, but you know, management matters, seeing these things through, uh, reviewing what's been happening and, uh, and attending to the, to the next uh, phase of development. So primary care, vitally important. Is it fit for purpose? In a patchy sort of way, probably yes, but an awful lot uh, needs to be done. And also we need some really good research to start to understand whether what we're doing is actually having the intended impact. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was excellent. That was a great um, presentation, very thought provoking and, and very relevant. I've got a few questions coming through, but I would encourage people to start to post questions if you haven't already done so. So just give you a second Judith, before I read out one of our first questions, and it's from over in New Zealand from Helen Gregory. And the question is, um, does Judith think that the Starfield principle of continuity of care in general practice is still as relevant with developments of a single shared electronic health record that patients can share with other providers. So given the shared electronic health record and the information that we can share between patients and providers, do you think that um, Starfield's principle of continuity of care in general practice is still relevant? Do you want me to pick that one up now, uh, Suzanne? Yeah, yeah, pick that up, because we've, we've got some quite different ones. So if you can pick that one up. Oh, yes. <laughs> Certainly in the morning here, sometimes we just come up while I've been speaking. So, um, uh, I, think, I think the principles are still as relevant, but I'd argue I'm just not sure primary care in lots of cases has ever really done that coordination. I take this back to that Commonwealth Fund slide where only about half of practices, at least 18% in Australia, know when someone's been to ED. Uh, you know, I, I think some of those basics, we assert those as important in primary care, and they don't often happen. Now, I think the, the issue about the electronic patient record, that's important, but that in a sense is a tool to help practices then enact the Starfield principles, because for many people, whether in a vulnerable situation, you need help with care coordination, you need help to understand what services are out there, and which ones you need or your the person you're caring for needs and um, I just think too often it's left it is the patient or their carer who's drawing together different bits of the health system whether that's bits of the disability services system hospital system primary care so I, I think the Starfield uh, principles hold true um, the bit that I am um, challenged by at the moment is um, the paper I mentioned by I've seen my Jeden colleagues recently in the BMJ about gatekeeping. I just think there's, um, there's something quite paternalistic about a gatekeeping approach that primary care knows best for us. And that paper actually talks about the whole movement about self-care and self-management so that that comes up against, against it. So, Let's see what others have to say, but for me, there's, um, that's where I think that one of the Starfield principles might just be challenged. I think it's breaking down because being challenged about how we think about that. Thanks, Judy. Okay, we'll change a little tack a little bit. There's um, a question here from, a, from an Australian perspective, so um, we'll, we'll go with that one, and it's from Rachel Wright. And the question is, there seems to be limited resources within the primary healthcare sector to evaluate effective primary care models. The acute sector seems to collect data well using standardised systems. What measures can we as researchers suggest to measure the improvement of clinical or health outcomes? 
so and just the context in terms of, of Australia that we do quite well in terms of collecting individual level patient data and linking that data in a hospital setting but we're not as good at, in terms of general practice and primary care just some, some thoughts on, on what we might need as researchers do you want me to answer that one Suzanne or someone else or well, you, you're the only person who can actually speak. I think either me or you, so I can have a go at okay. <laughs> Yes, there are limited resources to evaluate um, primary care models, but again, there's a challenge for us as researchers to advocate to research funders. I, I think your um, your uh, associations and your meeting coming up at the beginning of December, I think, is looking at where health service research is going, is it? I think you've been thinking about uh, the future of health services research in Australia and New Zealand, but I think continuing to make the case for needing this evidence base in, in, in primary care in particular, I think, is something we all need to do. We have a responsibility to do that. So uh, I'm a great believer in not, not complaining about things, uh, but trying to actually. Uh, uh, to make that difference at a policy at a funding level. Um, on the data collection part of it, um, I mean, data is collected in primary care, but I think in different countries there's often an issue about who owns the data because some of that it often belongs to the independent practices. I think that's something that's interesting when we see the collected, the networks, the, whether it's been IPAs or super partnerships, you see people says so opening up their books and their data to each other and using that in some quite different ways. So I think where the trust is built, and you've got the collective organisations, you've got a, a different platform and capability for, for doing analysis, which could be research analysis as well as the proactive health work. Um, the other thing I'll just flag there is that um, uh, my former colleagues at the Nuffield Trust they recently completed a piece of work um, looking across different primary care networks, trying to collect different quantitative data. Now that's not been easy, but I think I keep an eye on what they're doing. They've published some of their early work there. Um, and I know that also from, I'm involved in the National Evaluation of Integrated Care Pioneers here in the UK, a five-year study being led by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. But I think, and I, I think different ones of us in different countries are, are trying to do this, just as in the um, ACO movement and the uh, primary care medical homes in the States. So I guess the other challenge for us, sorry there, is, is how we, we bring together our research internationally uh, and we don't end up being atomised like primary care can be sometimes, but uh, we, we probably need to think more carefully about how we can share we're doing and finding. I don't think we've probably done that enough yet. I think, I suppose, from the Australian perspective, we look across the pond to you in, in UK and we think that you're better or, or sharing more data than we might be for general practice level. I think for some you are, but for generally it's quite hard to, to get um, data. And as I say, I think one of the things is around the, tr the whole trust element. So it's sort of a building that trust and that momentum. But I think we do look across sometimes we feel that and um, that it's, it's more easily accessible and I, I don't necessarily think that's always the case, is it, in terms of UK and... and it's not the case at all. I mean, basic primary care activity data is not in the public domain. It, it is only surveyed every five years. Um, our researchers have to actually purchase that data. It's not, it's not actually in the public domain, a lot of it. So, um, and a number of us have, have talked about that at different points as being a, a problem uh, for, for research. So, um, no, I, I, I don't think any of us have cracked it. Um, but it's those of us who are researchers who it's behoven on us to, to really think carefully about this, I think, and to, to design studies. Um, and certainly, I think for those of us who are researchers, there is a real opportunity with more primary health networks, uh, super partnerships, federations, how, you know, these more collective arrangements where they've got more management and political support to find ways which. We can build trusted relationships and work with them to undertake the research we want to and need to. Okay, we have a couple more questions. So, if that's all right with you, Judith, I'll continue with the questions. Um, so, one's around the model of care. So, you talked a little bit about models of care and how important that is. And you gave an example around where, um, from the UK, where the hospital um, had sort of taken over the primary care. Um, 
apart and brought that in in house want a better word the question is around that really and the question is from um joseph scott jones and it's is there a danger in the scaled up scaled up models where in primary care is blended with larger hospital based systems that the risk averse hospital will overcome the risk accepting primary care provider and more result more cost will result from including lab tests etc yeah, yeah I mean, that's about being consumed, isn't it? But the um, primary care being consumed and then becoming quite inefficient, I think, was that what that question is leading towards? I mean, I think I mean, there's a range of risks from that scale of provision. And one, um, we, I think we're starting to see from just some early research coming out, both in certainly in the UK and some, I think, in the United States, is that kind of more at scale approaches to primary care can be attractive from a sustainability point of view, from organising things, but whether patients and families actually like it, sort of the question, so there's a real challenge about keeping the personal nature of primary care, people feeling they've got the local uh, practice or health centre to attend where they, they feel people are familiar. So that, that's important, that, I think that is a risk. And I, that is also a risk, I think, with some of the, the hospitals sort of reaching out and running primary care. So a real challenge for them to understand primary care and how, how it works. But I guess the challenge back is to say, we have to understand why that's happening. And actually, I think that's sometimes happening because practices, for whatever reason, are not viable or just feel burnt out and it's not want to be taken over. Um, so it, it then gets into how, how does primary care work with its acute sector colleagues? Um, and I'll just take us back to that Commonwealth on slide again, where practices just often don't know what's happening in the hospital sector. They're not getting the information. The care isn't being coordinated across. It, I think it just shows we've got a lot more to do there. Um, yeah. And I suppose you weren't necessarily advocating that as the model, but it, that, that not as the model, but that is our model. So it's that thing back to local, isn't it? That it's in some ways it, it will be very different for different local regions of the country, as well as different and similar across countries. Absolutely, I'm not advocating it as the model at all. I'm just observing that it's happening, um, albeit not on a large scale. But um, I think, yeah, and I think in tough financial times such as we certainly face with our public services in this country and as many countries do across uh, across Europe that um, you know there is an attraction at one level to taking that sort of approach particularly when there are ever rising numbers of people presenting at ED uh, as emergency departments which again I think takes us back in primary care so quite tough questions we have to ask about why do people, why are they going to ED? And is it back to my point about, well actually my practice is closed every evening and weekend so it's not even after hours arrangements are not always great coordinated. You know, the challenge back is, well, people will go there, won't they? So I think some of these things are, rather than us always perhaps criticising the hospital for what it's doing, is to say to ourselves, why is it that's happening? And what's our response in primary care and how do we get alongside hospital colleagues? Particularly, I think that's where perhaps primary care in its networks or its bigger organisations has got more ability probably to do that. So actually to try and offer some solutions to you know colleagues who are often very hard pressed in the hospital sector as well. And so shifting a little bit again around to the research elements, you've had a question um, and I think it links to that focus that you had on not just, not just about, you know, look, shift, looking at organisations and structure, which we sometimes get a little bit obsessed, both in policy terms and in sometimes in research terms, but a focus on those models of care. So what do you think as, as researchers we need to do in this area to support practice and to influence policy? My goodness, you want me to do this? <laughs> 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 you can scratch your head as well, it's fine. I can share, yeah, I need to do it myself. Any uh, hints and tips in terms of what, where we should be focusing on for future? Well, I, I think as researchers, I think we need to be alongside the new, well, they're not so new, but alongside these different models of, of primary care, spend time within them observing what they're doing, how they're working. You know, 
I sit on research funding bodies when you sometimes see proposals coming forward that sometimes still feel about, still interested in, I don't know, um, different approaches to giving education sometimes in primary care or about, I'm, I'm exaggerating to prove the point, but you know, they don't always seem to, or they still are assuming that everybody's in practice as they always were, they're not always understanding the fact there is a wider infrastructure now that support their across networks and practices. So I think as researchers, we first of all need to understand the context of primary care and realise that it has been changing and how it's been changing. And then to explore, um, it goes back to my point about organisational and management change, the sort of research that's needed, and some of this is in that paper I mentioned by Tara Lamont and colleagues, but to say, well, we need really good quantitative data because we have got to start to really seriously understand are these new models of care working for patients and carers? Are they different approaches to organising care, helping staff or not? We need to understand those because at the same time, we need research that can be perhaps more action research focused, it's formative, it's feeding back regularly to those leading these networks so they get their, but they have got time to wait three years for uh, an outcome of research study. Are we? Building in some really different, perhaps ethnographic and so formative uh, approaches. Um, but I said, if you start by understanding what it is we're seeking to research, then understanding what the questions are that need answering with people. Now, I think using some, some, some quite different or different combinations of, of, of methods. Which is your point about the using the mixed methods. I suppose the challenge we have in Australia, and I don't know if it, it's similar in, in UK these days, but is around getting funding for that sort of research. So health services research gets a very small percentage of, of the funds from, from government yeah. organisations. So I suppose it's about working through how we can gain funds to be able to do that type of research, which doesn't often get as well funded as, say, a clinical trial or a much more quant-based study. And, and Nessa don't have to answer that, but that's a challenge that we face here. In terms of in terms of research, and we thought, like, yeah, and we, I think we, I said we face that challenge across the different countries. My slight pushback on that one to say is, I'm talking about these studies need to have a significant quantitative element. I'd argue often our health services research we have done in primary care and has been too often more on the the kind of qualitative or even like slightly challenging. We've described what's going on. But we haven't always really tried to understand what impact this is having. And yeah, we have to use sort of proxy measures of, of outcomes sometimes. But I, I think actually, I mean, I would encourage people to look at Tara Lamont's paper and, and similar work like that to say, because that's talking about you need really good economic studies nested within it. I mean, the big study I'm involved in is my year study of integrated care at the moment. The biggest element of it is cost effectiveness analysis of multidisciplinary team working. We don't need to describe anymore what integrative care looks like, well not very much, but we do need to start to understand what, what are the costs and benefits or not of having different forms of multidisciplinary team working in that particular study. So I think I'm making a plea for actually more, if it's mixed methods, it's actually more quantitative often. So hopefully, um, if well designed, we'll be more attractive uh, to our funders. Yeah, so getting that evidence. Because, and the other thing what we, we struggle with, with sometimes here is, is when models of care are set up, is not actually capturing a baseline. So having nothing to measure against. So you're two or three years in and somebody comes along and asks you to do some retrospective with some data that actually there was no baseline captured. So the best you can do is have a look and then you end up with qual because you have to ask someone how it was for them and what was the experience right, like rather than actually have some baseline quants and then do the experience as well. So. No, absolutely. In the, in the study I mentioned, the five-year integrated pioneer study, uh, sorting out what usual care is, <laughs> as, as opposed to the pioneer care, is, is indeed exercising us. <laughs> Okay, so I just, um, another couple of questions. Um, another one from New Zealand colleagues. So um, one here around, with other providers entering the virtual care market, does general practice have a relevant service offer for young, well adults? So we've got a virtual um, care market and does general practice have a relevant service offer for young, well adults? Um, well, I don't, I, I, my question back is always does it? Um, um, I think, well, based on my knowledge here in the UK, I'd say sometimes in a patchy sort of way, but no, not a lot of the time as I observe it, but I mean, others, um, 
others may have, have more experience of that, but it, it doesn't feel to me that that's um, being developed quickly enough, um, or certainly not at scale. And it does raise, I mean, it's an issue across health services, isn't it? How innovation can be scaled up uh, and adopted. And, Perhaps the challenge there to us in primary care is that we need to be looking at some of that wider literature and evidence about um, innovation into practice, quality and service improvement, because I think what we're talking about here is exactly that. And if we're not careful, I think parts of primary care will just get overtaken or, or, or grieved off. Thank you. There's one last question, which is very... Um quite Australian and um, centric but we'll, we'll go there and you might just um, decide you want to just just um, take it rather than and potentially respond that um, anyway let's go for it how important do you think it is that public funding via Medicare will pay for Australians to attend as many different general practices as they wish even in a single day none of whom have any obligation to communicate with each other so that's around our current system and I suppose that's related to you know here in Australia how patients can go GP shopping and you can go to potentially as many GPs as you might want and still yeah. get funded by the public purse. Well, which in reality, I think we can in the different countries, albeit with slightly complicated funding arrangements that follow us around. Um, I went to a walk-in centre last week because I couldn't get the point with my own practice. So, you know, people, <laughs> people, um, People do do this. I, I think my answer to that one would be have a look at the paper by um, Asif Majid and, and colleagues two or three weeks ago. The one that questions gatekeeping in the international context. He talks about Australia and most of the countries in that paper because it is actually just pointing out um, that we've got the whole kind of self-care, self-management, person-centred approach that I think many of us believe in, we've got that alongside this sense of the practice we should belong to. And I think how those two could be kind of held in tension, really, I don't think it's harmonised, but held in tension is an interesting question. I don't think it's behind that question that's just being put. It's kind of, and I guess the question back to primary care is why is someone feeling they need to go to different places now? I mean, they may just be going, I don't know, because they've got medically mixed based symptoms and a set of other issues that need resolving, but is it because they're not getting the services they feel they need or is no one coordinating it? Um, I don't know, but I, I think there's, the, the question back to us is why do we? See, that's a problem. There's a resource aspect to that, but for me, there's a more profound one about the sort of care we could and should be providing, or whether we're keeping pace with what people expect. And there's some work that we've been involved in here, and, and we've found that with chronic disease patients that are quite, they tend to keep with the same GP and actually want the same GP, actual GP within a practice, and so not yeah. just the same practice. And so, I suppose the question is, who are the people that are? A shopping and, and you, like you say is that a problem if I go to one practice for one thing another practice for another as long as I feel that's fine and there are we know very answering and just one interesting very quick point I know times against this on that I do know of um, examples in different countries again certainly I've heard of some here in the UK people are starting to say particularly within these sort of um, super partnerships or primary care networks to say you might need a specific list of people with complex long-term conditions, a specialist list of patients within that larger practice or organisation who are cared for by a, a dedicated team, the same group of GPs or geriatricians, cardiologists or whatever, but actually you have to manage them in a different way because again going back to them going around different places might because they're just not being dealt with appropriately and we know they're high risk, they're high cost and so on. Again, I think some work on that I think has also been done by the Commonwealth Fund. So actually perhaps you have to, it's back to the design principles, do you need something specific for those who need um, a different sort of consultation, a different sort of care for their complex needs, to almost sort of separate that from the way you handle the episodic care for those who are largely speaking well. Okay, I think that brings us to the end. We've not got any um, other questions um, to ask at this point. Anything you'd like to add and to finish um, to finish off on, Judith? Any other final points you'd like to close with? 
No, I don't think so. I really welcome the the chance to be um, to be part of the uh, the webinar. Um, it's uh, be uh, nice in due course to hear hear more or to carry on this discussion uh, in, in some way. I was back in Australia and New Zealand for, during August and uh, enjoyed hearing more about about what's happening. But I think the overall that I think the challenge to us is. How we do connect up our research and analysis across the, the, the different nations. Um, I say just that warning that we can end up being atomised if we're not careful in the same way that primary care can. So I think again, collectively we can both learn from one another, but perhaps we can also advocate together for some, um, some high quality uh, research studies and uh, even funding. So thank you very much. Sounds good. So, so thank you very much. So that does bring us to the end of the webinar. And I would like to take the opportunity just to say thanks for a great presentation. Some real, very topical and thought provoking um, points that you got across to the to the audience. And thanks to our audience um, across the globe for your contribution and your questions. And of course, it goes without saying to um, thank um, Sarah Green, our executive officer, um, who organises all of the seminar, the webinars and all the technical support. So any problems, give Sarah a ring, anything good, then you can come back to the rest of the committee. That's how it generally works. But I also direct you to our website, which outlines details on our webinar series and more details on the events. And um, we've got the conference coming up and also um, our symposium being held on the 1st of December in Canberra. Uh, the other thing to say is we are um, we are a membership organisation, so please do feel free to to have a look at the website and consider joining. Finally, just enjoy the rest of the day or evening, whatever time it may be, and we look forward to having you join us in future events. So thank you all very much for your time. Okay, Judith, there's still people online, but thank you very much. That was excellent.